Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments. For tonight, we're going to take a deep dive into the TI-84 Plus family, uh, looking at modeling with tables, geometry, and trigonometry. This is the second part in an overall three-part series, uh, so in case you missed the first part, uh, we'll show you later on where you can uh, get access to that. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI technology to make, to make tough to teach, tough to learn concepts, accessible to all my students. I'm really excited to introduce our panelists for tonight, Karen Camp and Debbie Poss. Unfortunately, Debbie had a family emergency and isn't able to join us tonight, but we are lucky to have Karen with us. Karen was an instructor of mathematics education at Yale for 15 years and previously taught high school and middle school math for 13 years. She's been a T-cubed national instructor since 1998 and has been an author of materials for summer workshops and TI instructional websites. Karen speaks often on how to use technology effectively to enhance student understanding. Karen, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Really glad to be here, Mike. We're expecting a large crowd, so if you have any questions for Karen at any time, please feel free to use the Q&A window to send those. We're going to be using the chat window to send general messages. As a reminder, we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance at the conclusion of the webinar. We hope you don't have any audio issues, but in the event that you do, try selecting Communicate from the top of the WebEx menu and choose Audio Broadcast. At this point, Karen is going to discuss our agenda. We're really excited that you're here to join us for a deep dive into advanced capabilities of TI-84 Plus technology and how it can be used as a tool for inquiry. We will share activities using tables and lists to explore topics in geometry, trigonometry, and also algebra one and two. We'll explore different representations for growth and multiple ways to investigate invariance. Finally, we'll discuss strategies for questioning that foster inquiry and talk about how to summarize inquiry learning experiences to make it stick for your students. Thanks so much, Karen. And tonight, uh, we really hope that you'll walk away uh, with this kind of growth mindset, um, not just in maybe geometry and trigonometry, but in general in more, uh, more broad mathematics. Uh, we are going to be doing a lot of geometry and trigonometry tonight, so if that's what you signed up for, we're glad that you're here. Uh, but the first example that we're going to do might not look uh, super akin to geometry and trig. So um, if you signed up for the geometry and trig part, that's great. Uh, just don't uh, – just make sure you get through the first, the first activity. Um, we're also going to be exploring patterns and trigonometry and also using Cabri Jr., the geometry app to explore invariance. Karen, let me give you control, and then you can share your screen. Okay. Okay, so what you should be seeing is my TI SmartView emulator software, and I just want to remind you that there's actually three emulators in one that live here. We've got the TI-84 Plus CE. Uh, that's the one that matches the TI-84 plus CE calculators. But you'll see me uh, going to some of the other emulator, one of the other emulators as well, as a way to uh, switch between activities quickly in the classroom. So the first activity, as Mike mentioned, isn't actually geometry, but one of the ideas that Debbie and I talked about and were really excited about was how to use tables to help give another window on growth. How do things grow? A big task in Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 classes for kids is to distinguish between linear, exponential, and quadratic growth. So uh, just to let you know, we're doing a deep dive tonight. Uh, there are uh, detailed instructions in the webinar documents on how to do tables. So if something that I'm saying uh, passes you by, all the instructions are in the webinar documents. When you normally look at second table set, this is how you set up a table on your calculator. By default, the table start is at zero, the delta table or the increment is at one, and the independent and dependent variables for the columns in the table are automatically filled in. 
So Debbie's activity that she started us off with here is originally an activity where students are going to be comparing different types of salaries they might get at jobs. And she had set it up, and this is in your webinar documents, where you have one salary that's a linear growth, one salary that's quadratic growth, and one salary that's exponential growth. Um, but before she got that started, she had a warm-up activity. And this warm-up activity was starting with these three functions. And yes, you're all math teachers, so you recognize these as linear, quadratic, and exponential growth. But for a moment, let's imagine putting on our student hats here. And uh, one of the important points is that even though we may recognize these formats of functions, students might grasp them even better if they can look a little bit at the numerical patterns. So when we compare these functions, one way to ask students to compare these functions is to take a look at the n numbers that are associated with them, the table of values. But we're not going to start with the auto auto in our table. We're going to set our table to let us ask for the independent variable. And what that does is that means our table will be blank. So in the classroom, we might say to students, what do you want to know about these three functions? What points do you think might be important? What x values should we try? And students might start with uh, the x equals 0, because that'll get us our y-intercepts. Oh, very interesting. All of our y-intercepts are the same. What about at x equals 1? Hmm, pretty close. Not exactly close. What about at x equals 2? Now things start to change up. Students might be interested in things that are happening between 0 and 1. You can do that as a decimal value. You can also do that as a fractional value. The fraction template is found on the CE calculators by pressing alpha x. Another way to get that fraction template is by pressing alpha y equals. Let me just show you that. Alpha y equals. This works on all of the TI-84 family of calculators, choosing number one, numerator over denominator. So we might want to look at what happens when x is 1 half and look at that as a fraction. And this is beginning to give us a picture of the growth. In between 0 and 1, we may care about which, frac which of these three functions dips down lower, which one's higher, versus after 1, which one is getting higher faster. Now, of course, just looking at the tables alone isn't going to give us a full picture. You may, at some point or another, look at your graph. Right now, I'm on a standard window. There's the standard window. I have turned on my uh, grid. And the grid shows us that we're not dealing with a square window here, uh, meaning that the spaces between the x values and the y values on the axes are not equal. But at any rate, the, the graph itself isn't incredibly helpful to see what's going on right in here. We could zoom in, but that's what the table uh, is going to help us out with. Really what we're after here is how do these things grow? So we're going to go back now and we're going to change our table to an auto-independent, but an ask-dependent. And what this is going to allow us to do is to move down a column in the table and see how the growth is happening. So students might have an idea about how these are growing. I'm going to press Enter. And we've, gotten, we've already seen some of these values. But as I'm pressing Enter, think to yourself with your student hat, what is happening to these y values? How is this function growing? And I think that you can say here that this is the y values are increasing by 3 each time. And you go back, and that 3 is here as our slope. That's where the increase is coming from. Back to our table. Let's go over to our second column. And again, put on your student hat. How do you think these values are growing? What mathematical changes are happening as we move down this column? So some students who are still in the what's being added idea might say, well, first you're adding 4, then you're adding 6, then you're adding 8. 
But hopefully what they're seeing going on here is it's increasing and it's not increasing by a constant amount. We're going to come back to that increases in a minute. There's not a multiplication rule that's working here. That multiplication rule is going to show up in the next one. So again, enter. We're going to move down, down, down. And how do these values grow? These values grow by multiplying. And the multipl multiplication is 3. And that is our base of our exponent. So once the pattern has been identified, there's one more really neat thing that we can investigate with these patterns, and that is to go to the lists. Press stat and edit. And I've just loaded list one with our uh, numbers from one to eight. I could continue on, but that's good enough for now. What is really interesting is you have the opportunity in lists to put in a formula. So if I want L2 to be my first function that I have stored in Y1, arrow up to the top of the list, press Enter, and we want to tell L2 to apply the Y1 function. I'm pressing alpha trace to get Y1. I want to apply the Y1 function to the values in L1. Second one gives us L1. And what this is going to do is this is function notation. Take the Y1 function and apply it to L1. And these are the same values that we saw on the table earlier, increasing by 3 each time. I might have started with a 0 in my list, but I didn't think to. At any rate, we noticed that they increased by 3. Some of you might teach common differences as a method to prove or, or to uh, just confirm that we've got linear growth here. There's a command in the list menu right here above the stat button. And so we're going to go over to L3, move your arrow, your arrow your cursor up to the top of the column, and press Enter, which puts it down here so we can edit this list. And then do second stat for the list command. Under operations, ops, we're going to do number 7, delta list, which is going to figure out the increment for the previous list or the list that we select. So we want to know the increment list back from L2. Second 2 gets us L2. And sure enough, our linear growth is increasing by 3. Let's try it out with quadratic growth. Sadly, the formulas that we put into the lists don't remain like a spreadsheet formula. They now become static values. In order for us to clear out list 2, I'm going to press clear and then enter. You use the delete button to just clear out an individual cell. If you accidentally push delete while your cursor is up on the top of the column, you'll actually delete the list. Don't worry. Under stat, you can use setup editor to restore the lists that should have been there. Anyway, let's go up L2. We want to apply the second function, our quadratic. Alpha trace gets me my y variables. I want y2 to be applied to list 1. And there are the values from the quadratic. Once again, this list 3 that we set up isn't dynamic. It doesn't remember that we wanted to find the delta list. I'm going to clear that out, enter, arrow back up to the top, and I'm going to get that list command again, delta list, and I want to find the differences from list 2. Here they are. That's interesting. They aren't constant, but their differences are constant. We're going to prove that or confirm that in L4. We are going to get that list operation again, and we're going to find the differences on L3, and here's our constant list. And if you do this process with the exponential, I'll leave that exercise to you, you will find that it never condenses down to any common differences, any constant differences. OK, so that's an exploration with linear, quadratic, and exponential. There's so much more you can do with this, but we've got more to do. And we're going to turn our attention to some coordinate geometry. 
what I mentioned before is that there's a few ways to manage different activities in the classroom or if you want to get things prepared so your students aren't waiting around for you. One of those ways is for you to save the emulator state, meaning save everything that's going on in our emulator. And I did this earlier. It's under Actions. And I saved a different emulator state, which I'm going to load up now. If I load my emulator state, I've got to find where I saved it. Here it is, Activity 2. And it's going to clear out whatever is in there right now. But this enables you, if your class is ending and you want to save what you're in the middle of, you can return to it the next class. Just save it as period 5 on a certain date, and, and there it is. Okay, so what we're going to do next is we're going to take a look at um, some coordinate geometry transformations. And so what we're going to do here is, if you recall, I had looked at a standard window earlier, and that standard window, um, this is not the standard window, that standard window was not a square window. Let me just turn this off a second. That standard window was not a square window, meaning that the uh, spaces between the X and the Y scale marks were not equalized. For this activity, it's really important to have a square window. So what we've done is we've done um, zoom decimal, except we doubled the zoom decimal window. And so this is um, in your handouts, in your documents, you'll be able to see exactly what this window was. And what we've got here in our lists is we've got four points, and those four points we're going to set up as a scatter plot. And that plot number one is set up as a connected dot plot, a, li a linear plot. I'm going to turn that on. I can turn it on directly from the Y equals screen if I've already set up the details. And here we have a little flag, and what we're going to do is we're going to do some coordinate geometry to perform transformations in the coordinate plane. The figure can be anything you want as long as it's asymmetrical because it's very hard to visualize different transformations if your figure has too much symmetry to it. Okay, so the other thing we're going to do here is we're going to go to mode and go to the graph table split screen. Because what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some of the transformations as we are changing them up. The first question that we want to do is what if we wanted to do a translation uh, four to the right and two down? So what that means is we're going to take every one of our x values and it's going to turn into x plus 4. And we're going to take every one of our y values and it's going to turn into y minus 2. Back in our lists, we're going to go over to L3 and that's going to give us our transformation on the x value. So second, L1 was my x values. I wanted to go 4 to the right. So I do L1 plus 4. Enter, and there we've got it. And I want to do two down, so my Y list, L4, is going to be L2 minus 2. Enter. Let me just take a quick look at my stat plots, make sure I have those set up. Plot 2, I don't have it set up. I want to turn that on. I want to make it a connected dot plot and I want to use list 3 and list 4. Okay, and let's check out what we've got, check out our graph, and there we are. We are 4 to the right and 2 down. Now, with my split screen, my window might not be square anymore. Let me just see if I can fix this up. I'm not sure if I can, but zoom square will do it. There we go. Now we've got square aspect ratio there. And the students can be asked to do a whole bunch of different things with this. You can have them do different kinds of reflections. You can have them do rotations. You can also provide them with a picture of a screen and have them write the transformations to uh, create that, have them write the, the steps for the transformation to create that screen. So 
this here is just a little taste of some coordinate geometry with the lists. Let's just try one more. What if we wanted to um, take our transformations and we want to um, reflect the flag over the y-axis? Now, when students are asked to reflect the flag over the y-axis, what they're really doing is they're reflecting it in the horizontal direction, so they're really affecting the x values. I've actually changed the language I use around reflections to, say, make a reflection in the horizontal direction, because students get confused. If we're reflecting over the y-axis, am I changing y or am I changing x? I also try to visualize it with students so that they really have a visual. I literally will hold up my hands in the air and show the reflection in the x direction or the reflection in the y direction. Back to our, our um, sorry, back to our stat edit. If we're reflecting in the x direction, let me clear out list three. I'm going to take my x values and replace them with the opposite. So list 3 is going to equal the opposite of list 1. And my list 4, if I'm reflecting over the y-axis in the x direction, nothing's going to change of the original y's, but I need to tell list 4 that it should copy list 2. And if we check the graph, there it is. And as I said, you can use this with um, reflections, rotations, translations, dilations, or any combination. Mike, do we have any questions so far? Karen, none just yet. But uh, okay. again, as, as, uh, as they come in, I'll let you know. And if anyone does have questions, please feel free to use that Q&A window on the right side. And just a reminder that this is being recorded. Um, we really would prefer that you don't try and follow along step by step with Karen tonight because uh, I think it's going to be pretty tough to do. Uh, but just know you'll be getting a link to the recording in your email within a couple of days, and you'll be able to go at your own pace. Okay. Um, before we get into our next activity, what I wanted to do is give you a little bit of a framework to thinking about the TI-84 Plus as a tool for inquiry. There's a lot of discussion out there in educational circles about how can we make inquiry learning really work, or um, does it get as much done, or uh, my students may or may not remember it, or what if their algorithms or procedures aren't as efficient as the one I use. And here's some ideas that I have that I use with my students. The first thing is I use open-ended questions and scenarios without questions, and we're going to see that in a minute on my next activity. You're going to see me start it by just what do you think about this, very open-ended. We've already seen how you can capitalize on multiple representations, numerical, graphical, algebraic, visual, and vary the order of presentation. Don't always start with an algebra equation and then graph it and then a table of values or vice versa. Mix it up because it helps make that learning more durable for students. The other thing, we've included a bunch of activities in your documents folder that you'll get after the webinar. And you'll see that these documents ask students to do things. They're not just watching the math, they're doing the math. They're being asked to make a written record of any notes, rough draft ideas, or other conjectures. And finally, in the classroom, uh, make sure you give students some thinking time and encourage a practice of allowing others in their small group to think before talking to each other. Don't steal another student's opportunity to think by talking too soon. Anyway, back to our emulator here. Another tip for managing several activities is to remember you've got two color emulators built in the Smart View. So if I go up to this calculator, I can go to the TI-84 Plus C, which is the other calculator model that has color. The TI-84 Plus is the black and white model that we know and love. The TI-84 Plus C is color, and it has nearly all of the same commands as the CE not quite as up-to-date. Um, and the thing for you to know if you're going to switch between the emulators, they don't talk to each other, so it's not like what we just did on the CE emulator is going to appear here. The other thing is you can't save an emulator state on the CE, that's only, uh, excuse me, on the C, that's only for the CE side. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to dive into some geometry, and we're going to talk about invariance. 
And an invariant is something about a mathematical situation, a measurement, a calculation, a shape, or a location that stays the same while other parts of the situation are changing. So there's lots of great opportunities to discuss invariance in geometry. And one of the things I was really excited about sharing with you tonight is that I've discovered that there's ways to see invariance in tables as well, not just in geometry. So I'm going to begin, like I promised, with a picture. And the handout for this activity on central and inscribed angles starts with this picture and just asks students to write down some things that they notice about this diagram. And you might find out that your students notice things you hadn't thought about. Maybe you've got a student who thinks that this is the Star Trek logo on its side. Students might take us on a scenic route. Sometimes it's a mathematically scenic route, and sometimes it's just a scenic route. But there's a lot of fruitful opportunities for you to build on where the students are coming from. So anyway, think about some things that you want to know, that you notice, or you want to know about this diagram. Then what we're going to do is um, students are then, the next thing students are asked to do, here's the actual activity that students are going to be working on. Whoops. Students next are identifying the types of angles. So what is the, the proper name of which angle? Is one a central angle? One is an inscribed angle? And why is it called that? And make sure students have their definitions straight. OK, so going back to the emulator, here we go. I'm going to open up Cabri Jr. It's under Apps. And it is a really nice geometry software package right inside your calculator. It can't do everything that every geometry package can do. It's much less powerful than the TI Inspire geometry. But it does a lot of things really well. So I'm going to open up. Oh, and by the way, the um, there's a how-to on Cabri Jr. In, your, in the webinar documents. If you've never done this before, there's some tips for using it. The basic idea is that the Y equals window zoom trace and graph buttons give you our menus. We're going to open up this circle angle, circ ang activity. And here is the activity as students might see it when they first open it. And what you'll notice is that we've got some angle measures already measured for students. Depending on your students' uh, capability levels, you can have them measure it themselves. I find that I want to spend the time with the students exploring the mathematical situation, so I'm going to set it up for them, although there's a lot of value in having students setting it up themselves. Cabri Jr. allows us to make measurements to two decimal places. If you hover over one of the measurements, you'll notice that my cursor has turned to a hollow arrow. That means that that's active or able to be grabbed and moved. If you wanted to change the number of decimal places, right now we have the maximum of two decimal places. I click on the Subtract button, and one of my decimal places vanishes. And I click on the Subtract button again, and the other decimal place vanishes. I thought that this activity worked pretty well with two decimal places, so that's why it's set up that way. But you can decide what works for your students. I'm hitting the plus button to put back those digits of accuracy. And by the way, the, these little calculator files, it's very easy to send them out to the student calculators. You just hook one calculator to your computer and use the free TI Connect software to send it. And then calculators can be linked up with the short calculator to calculator cable. Or you can have students coming up to your computer. What I do is I have a USB hub in my room. And so that has four USB plugs and four cords. So four students can get this activity at the same time. Anyway, what students are being asked to do here is they're being asked to move and drag and grab parts of these geometry figures. One of the most powerful things about dynamic geometry software is that you have many, many, many renditions of this setup uh, within the, the, the 
uh, construction. And by the way, this is constructed, and anything you see me do is going to be constructed. It's not just drawn to look like it. It's actually constructed. Point C that I'm about to grab is on the circle. It's not just laid down in the vicinity of the circle. When your cursor is um, a hollow arrow, the alpha button is the grabber hand, and you don't have to hold it down. And the first thing students are asked to do is to move point C around and see what they think is going on here. And as we move point C, they might be making a conjecture about what's going on with these angles. When I'm done moving point C, I might move point A. I might get all sorts of different scenarios, but I want students in their handout to verbalize what they think is going on. Then we're going to go over, and students are instructed to move point B. And what's interesting here is that as point B moves, students, some of them are very surprised as to why the angle values don't change. And you might know exactly why. That's something to discuss. And once students have had a chance to um, verbalize what they think the rule is, I'm going to let go of that B right there for a second. Up here, I calculated a ratio of angle AOC divided by angle ABC. And again, you can have students do this on their own. But what I decided to do was to hide away the answer to this calculated ratio. The graph button gets us the hide show tool. And since I remembered that I had that calculation hidden there, that's why that box is there. Once I move off the box, you don't know it's there. But I remembered that I hid it there. And the student instructions are told, go in the vicinity of, go right underneath that and press Enter. And there is our ratio. And this ratio recalculates, even though it might not feel like it recalculates, this ratio does recalculate every time that we move any of our points. So if I move point A, by the way, not only is my arrow a hollow arrow, but if you've got really good eyes, you can see that point A is flickering at me. I'm off the point now. You can see the circle flickering. I want the point, and that tells me that that's what I'm going to grab. So if I grab point A now, my ratio isn't changing. That's not because it was a calculation that was done earlier and it's done. It's because the ratio is a constant ratio. So this activity doesn't ask students to do this, but I think you can imagine that we can get uh, students to take a look at an angle inscribed in a semicircle. I'm not quite there. It's kind of hard to get it exactly there with the right pixels, but I think you can see what's going on here. And if I move point A back to where it was before, the student activity isn't enough. It may be enough for some classes and some students but it, uh, to just confirm this property. But I do also set up this kind of a picture to ask students to prove it. And the actual proof takes three cases. But if you want to do proof, if that's part of your curriculum, you can have students prove that angle AOC is twice angle ABC with this kind of a diagram. OK, so that is Cabri Jr. When I was uh, doing some, a different geometry activity with Cabri Jr., I was starting to um, think about trigonometry. Before I do that, let me just show you this, which is that when you're doing these activities, students have a handout, but you want to make sure the handout has good questions and that you ask good questions as you're going. Ask students, what do you observe? What questions could be asked about this graph, table, or diagram? What more information do you want to know? What changes, what stays the same? That's a particularly important question for invariance. What is in common? What is different when you're comparing and contrasting different graphs or different diagrams? How would you explain this process to a classmate or to a younger student? Can you convince me that something is true? What would happen if we try this? When will something be true? 
And there's plenty more that you can do in our webinar documents. There's a list of reasoning question stems, question prompts that you can use. Okay, so back to our Cabri Junior. I'm going to open an act, uh, another figure on right triangles. It asks me if I want to save the changes. I'm going to say no because I want to keep my original activity the way it was. I was starting to build an activity on trig ratios, and I realized that this was another opportunity to talk about invariance. So this trig activity, it's a right triangle, and this is not just drawn to be a right triangle, it's constructed to be a right triangle. And since there's so much going on right near the triangle, I put these two points out in space that let me move my triangle without having to get so close to it. And so they're my grabber points. They're like my controller points. One's up, one's down there, and one's up here. And you might have noticed that even though I moved the um, one down below, I still remained with a 90 degree angle because it's constructed with a perpendicular line. If you ever move something too far, or a way you didn't want it to be, the y equals menu has an undo command, and so you can undo back to the previous value. OK, so what I want you to do is I want you to think about this right triangle, and think about an invariant that might show up here, a value or a measurement or a calculation that might remain the same even when other things are changing. And I hope you noticed that the two angle measures for angle A and angle B, they have a nice property. And it may seem obvious to you, because we're the teachers, but it's not always obvious to the kids when they first look at it. Whoops. And that is that these two angle values add up to 90 degrees. Now, that may not seem so earth shattering, because of course they add up to 90 degrees, because they're the complementary acute angles in a right triangle. But even that is an invariant that's pretty important. And if you're trying to get your students to start noticing things that change and things that stay the same, this is a really nice little thing to begin to look at. So as I was building this, students um, we're being asked to figure out the different sine and cosines of angles A and angle B. And I'm just going to jump to another figure where I have everything displayed here. Um, I actually have them all hidden behind here. But I'm just going to um, go to y equals, and I'm going to open another version of this. And this has a whole bunch of stuff. And if I was doing this, this in the classroom, I, I would um, hide and show these one at a time. But we don't have a ton of time in our webinar, and I want to make sure I get to everything we have to do. So now what we've got, as a consequence, you and I know this is a consequence of those two acute angles being complementary. But if we move things, our sines and our cosines recalculate, but yet, we have some matching pairs going on here. And that's pretty powerful. And this was my insight, was that we could explore this in our tables, not just in a geometry context. So what we want to do is we want to say, wow, sine A and cosine B are the same. Cosine A and sine B are the same. Let's see if that's always true. I'm going to quit out of Cabri Jr. And I am going to put sine of x into my y1 and cosine of x into my y2. And notice we're in degree mode. My table set is set to start at 0 and to increment by 10. I'm back to the auto auto because I want my chart to fill in. I want my table to fill in. And the student handout, by the way, has a blank table for students to fill in. 
And you may say, why do we want students to copy this down? Isn't the technology doing the work for them? And I believe that by writing these down and asking students to copy down a couple of angle measures for sine and cosine, it gets them more involved in the math. And a student who just scans this list may or may not see the things that are the same. But if you're writing them down, huh, I've written that, that five-digit number before. So what do you notice? Explain any patterns that you observe. Then students are asked, are any values equal? Why do you think this occurs? And uh, students can change the table increment to try different angle values. But I hope you can see that sine y1 of 20 is going to be the same as cosine of 70. After this, when students have uh, spent some time playing around with this, we're going to change up our table and have them confirm their conjecture by turning the independent variable to ask and the dependent to auto. When this happens, it doesn't matter what our table increment is. We're still going to be able to put in any independent variables we want. And so students are prompted to put in the values 15 and 75, of course, strategically chosen. And then they're asked to put in 27 and 63. And then finally, they're asked to try another pair of their choosing until they can describe the situation in words or with a mathematical rule. And hopefully what they're going to say is those complementary co-function identities that sine of an angle equals cosine of 90 minus the angle or vice versa. And what I've done with the, um, let me see if I have it here, here we go. What I've done with the student activity is they are given this um, 3, 4, 5 right triangle to work with because I want students to justify why they think this is true. And so I have them put down the ratios for each of the different uh, sines and cosines. And once you start to write these down, you realize that the opposite from one perspective is the adjacent from the other. And I know you know this. Back to our um, emulator, we could have seen that in our Cabri Jr., just jumping back to that. Here it was, sine of A is BC over AB, and cosine of B is BC over AB. So there's lots of ways that students can find that out. But now let's go one step further. What happens if we want to figure out sine squared x plus cosine squared x, a very uh, fundamental identity that we're going to use in our Traeger pre-calculus classes? So um, as you all know, sine squared x, that squared comes before the x as a notation. But in order to put it into the calculator uh, y equals screen, we can start to get really mixed up with parentheses because what we're really doing is sine of x and then squaring it. So in order to make sure students uh, get this accurately done, the technology comes to the rescue, we're going to start by doing a parenthesis and we're going to square y1. Alpha trace gets us our y uh, variables. They're also found under this vars key but it's much, much faster to get them from alpha trace. So y1 squared plus y2 squared I wonder what happens when we find, do this computation. Let me go back to my table set. I'm going to put it back to auto. And wow, that's a pretty interesting phenomenon in Y3. If students haven't thought about this before, that's pretty surprising. Again, this 3, 4, 5 right triangle can help them start to think about why this might be true. If they really want to get that identity, they would have to draw a right triangle with a hypotenuse equal to 1 to really work that through, but the 3, 4, 5 does it just the same. 
So it's a really powerful idea that you can use the tables to examine trig identities. And there's lots of other identities that you can work through here. You can do some even and odd identities. You can investigate special right triangles. And you can also use double angles. You can look at those double angle rules. And if you set your table set to 15, there's some nice double angle things that you can pick up on or sums of different angles. So there's a lot of rules that you can extend this to if that works for you. Okay, so we've got uh, one more activity to take you through, plus a bonus if we have time. Mike, are there any questions before I get into our last big activity? Um, we've had a couple, but I think I'm going to see uh, if we have some time at the end. So okay, that sounds um, if we good. do, we might come back to it. Okay. So this next activity, what I'm going to do here is I've been working in my uh, CE. I've been working in my C emulator. I'm going to jump back to the CE. And if you remember, we were here. Um, one quick way to get things back where they were is second mem. Number seven is reset. And reset is where you might want to go if you want to reset kids' calculators before a test to clear all RAM of programs. I don't want to do that, but I do want to reset defaults. And what that's going to do is that that's going to send my window back the way it was. It's going to get my screens back the way they were. And um, what I want to work on now is the idea of growing patterns. And again, this is geometry, but it's also growth. Let's take a look at this visual pattern. There are lots of visual patterns that you can find out on the internet if you search. And this is a, one that I've used with students before. And again, notice the open-ended question. Examine the pattern above. What do you think the next image in the sequence will look like? So spend a 10 seconds. Decide what your next image in the sequence will look like. And what we want students to do is to fill in a chart First, I want them to think about what it looks like and what uh, made me make, maybe make a sketch and think about how these squares grow. How many squares do I add each time? Ultimately, students are going to fill out a chart for the number of squares that exist in the pattern for every step. Number three, describe in words how you think the pattern grows, lots of right answers. So let's go back to our y equals. And what I want to show you here is some really neat ways to connect different visions of that pattern to algebra and numerical representations. So my first student said to me, well, I see that there's one corner square, and then I add two more. Then there's one corner square, and I add two times two more. Then there's one corner squared, and I add two times three more, two times four more, or two times x more. And so their equation is 1 plus 2x. Another student said, I looked at this as a floor and a wall. This floor has two units, and the wall above it has one. This floor has three units, and the wall above it has two. Four plus three, five plus four. So five is one more than the step number. So what I'm really doing here is I'm taking one more than the step number, x plus one, for the floor, and then x for the wall. A third student said, what I'm seeing is a square with another square chopped out of it. Here's a 3 by 3 square with a 2 by 2 taken out of it. Here's a 4 by 4 square with a 3 by 3 taken out of it. And so the equation they put in was x plus 1 squared plus, I'm sorry, minus x squared. And you know, there's a, still more ways that you can describe these patterns, but this gives you a really nice opportunity to discuss whether these algebraic expressions are equal. Just for a minute, I'm going to turn off 
these equations that I've put in, you turn something off by pressing enter on the equal sign. That doesn't delete it, but it turns it off. And let's take a look at the table. Actually, I've got to see what our table is set at. That's the window. The table start, let's start at step one. And delta table is one. And sure enough, the first student's equation gives us the values of the number of squares in each diagram. And you may also notice that these are odd numbers. Let's now go over to y equals and turn on the other ones, reactivate them. And when you look at the table, all of them are the same because all the algebraic expressions are the same. The last piece of this is to have students think about this growing pattern recursively, meaning what do you have to do to the previous step to get the next step? And I hope you know, I hope you've thought about it and that we have to add two each time. What we can do is we can change the graphing mode here, and we can change it instead of function mode, I'm going to change it to sequence mode. And this might look a little unfamiliar, and it's, it is a little unusual if you haven't seen this before, if your students haven't seen it. But what you do is you say what is the first term number, n min is 1. And the first sequence, I'm doing an explicit formula, which is the same 1 plus 2x. The x key turns into an n key. I'm going to highlight the equal sign. I'm going to check the table. Oops. OK. Not sure what happened here. I'll just clear this out. OK, so let's check the table. And there we go. This was the same explicit formula that we used before, just in sequence mode. I wouldn't go to sequence mode just for explicit formulas. I would use it for recursive formulas if students need it. So to create the recursive formula, my first value is 3. So I have to tell the recursive formula that my first value is 3. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my previous term and add 2. So if we were writing this with subscripts, we would write v sub n minus 1. Those variables are up in alpha trace, just like the y variables were. I want v of n minus 1. I want to add 2 to it. Again, let's check the table. And there it is recursively. So it still works. OK, so hopefully you've gotten some ideas of how tables can really be a powerful learning tool and seen some applications using geometry and trigonometry. I want to jump back to one last PowerPoint and talk about what do you do after you've done these activities? How can you make sure that this sticks for your students? Some of the things that I do is I have students record their thinking and work on a written handout. Even if they've done it on a technology piece of technology, I want them to uh, record it and think about it with their own writing. If you don't have calculators in the hands of all your students, a lot of these things can still be done on the demonstration of the TI uh, Smart View emulator. And if you don't have that, there's a free trial that you can download. Second tip is to encourage reflection. Think about what happened, uh, what, what mathematical connections can you make. The next one is help students clarify their thinking to themselves and others, either in oral or written form, and utilize self-explanation. If they can explain a process to themselves, they're learning it better. And finally, don't just let the technology activity be that fun learning activity we did in class. Make sure you or the students summarize the activity, summarize the important results in writing after you're done to make sure that you indicate that it's important learning for the class. OK, so Mike, you said there might be some questions. Yeah, if you go all the way back to when you had done the flag yes. near the beginning. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you asked that, because I have an emulator state that I can load for that. Go ahead. What's the question? Um, we had a couple people asking how you would do a rotation. OK. So rotation, let me just turn on the plots here. Plot 1, I need to turn that on. And plot 2, I don't think we have any lists there yet. Um, plot 2, OK, so if we wanted to do a rotation, 
um, if you wanted to do, for example, a 90 degree rotation counterclockwise, these X values here become the Y values, and then the Y values turn into our negative X values. And so, a 90 degree counterclockwise rotation, our new X list is going to be our old Y values, L2. And our new Y list is going to be the opposite of our X values. And I have students write this down as XY turns into Y negative X, if I did it correctly. Let's see, let me turn on the second scatter plot. I turned off the first one. Did I turn off the first one? I know what I did. Sorry, guys. The second scatter plot, I need to tell it to look at lists three and four. Here we go. Second L3, second L4. Oops, I rotated it the wrong way. OK, so at any rate, what happened here is that our x values well, I've lost track of what I said, and I don't want to mix you up further. But the uh, standard rotations, the 90 degrees counterclockwise and clockwise, and the 180 degrees, there are easy, um, easy transformations. Here I've got it. 90 degrees counterclockwise, xy turns into the opposite of y, x. 180 degrees, xy turns into opposite of x, opposite of y and 90 degrees clockwise, or 270 counterclockwise, xy turns into y opposite of x. Any other question I can answer quickly? Um, Hannah asked if there was a way to take matrix values and graph them since multiply matrices will do rotations. Um, there may be, and I haven't investigated that lately. So I'm not certain, but I can check it out and get back to you, Hannah. If you send me an email, my email was on the uh, slides at the beginning, karen.camp at gmail.com. Thanks so much, Karen. OK. You want to send it back oh, to me? Yeah, one, yeah, I want to send it back to you, but there is one bonus activity in your webinar documents, and that's how to use a table to build your understanding of exponent laws. So that's a bonus activity for you guys to try on your own or with your students. Thanks so much. Did I send it so back to as you? We, oh, I got it. Go. Thank you. So as we uh, begin wrapping things up tonight, um, I did want to mention that if, uh, if you kind of jumped into the series and you missed uh, the first in a three-part series where you could find more information, so if you visit our website, education.ti.com, and under professional development near the middle, slide down to webinars, and you can look at the on-demand webinars and find that deep dive number one. And you can re-watch that, uh, look at all the documents, that's all free, um, as well as sign up if you're interested in looking at the third part of the series which is on October, October 23rd. 23rd. Yep. So um, if you haven't registered for that or any others that uh, may pique your interest uh, this fall, please feel free to do so. Again, everything's free. Uh, it's nice that if you register that you don't necessarily have to show up live because you automatically should get a link in your email to the recording as well as a link for the documents and a link to the certificate as well. Um, so it's helpful to, uh, to register for those even if you're not sure if you're going to be able to make it. To receive a certificate of attendance for tonight, nope, that's not the right link, sorry. Try this again. Click the link in the chat window. Also listed is a link for the documents that Karen used tonight. Um, and as she mentioned, uh, her and Debbie put a lot of time together 
uh, creating these documents. There's lots of uh, goodies in there, so please feel free to check out those documents. Um, and if you're watching this on demand, go ahead and copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate. Karen, thanks so much for everything. Uh, we're sorry that Debbie wasn't able to join us tonight, uh, but it was great that you were able uh, to forge on and, and do such a great job. So thanks so much for everything. You're so welcome. I also just want to do a shout out. If you are planning to come to Baltimore in March to the T-Cube uh, International Conference 2019, there's a special uh, discounted price if you register before October 31st and hope to see you there. Thanks so much, Karen. And thanks so much for joining us tonight. We hope to see you back online real soon. Have a great night.